represents years of preparation and the culmination of their high school career. I want to congratulate the eight senior art students whose work was displayed on the screen before we began and will be part of our June 1st evening of the arts. The Senior Symposium has prepared our graduates for the rigor of college academics. The tools and lessons gained from this experience will serve them well in the future. More than analyzing, researching, outlining, and writing. This process has demonstrated each graduate's ability to work independently, create a significant piece of original work, and present their work. Their work will be bound and displayed in our foyer and library, alongside the 27 classes who completed the senior symposium before them. As a class, they have chosen a wide breadth of authors and topics as unique as each of them. You are in for a treat tonight. Without further ado, we begin tonight with Olivia Tickle. Dorothea Lane's photography brought public attention to the poverty that characterized the United States during the Great Depression and helped strengthen federal support programs in the 1930s. Lane viewed photography as a way to capture the essence of people's experience and feelings and the public publication of her photographs evoked a response to people's suffering. Her work helped advertise the support program, program provided as a part of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, following the inaction of Roosevelt's predecessor, Herbert Hoover. Lane's most iconic photo from the Great Depression, The Migrant Mother, demonstrated her skills as a photographer. Migrant Mother was widely distributed, distributed throughout the 1930s as part of the Farm Security Administration Program to provide aid to struggling sharecroppers, migrant workers, and poor farmers. Although Lane sometimes felt frustrated by her belief that the migrant mother overshadowed her other photographs, her portrait's impact has lasted for decades because it so clearly captures the human suffering of the Great Depression. Dorothea Lane's photography reveals the struggles of life during the Great Depression, while Suman King shows the struggles of the female protagonist in her development. These young women rebel against their society and refuse to conform to the way the people around them want to live. The main protagonists do not like to be controlled, and they all share the desire to bend themselves and claim power by accessing an education. Through the lives of their protagonists, Suma Kid shows the obstacles that women face when they are held back and brought down by their family members and other people in their society. She is particularly critical of those who disparage women for having hopes and dreams other than what is expected of them. Through the fight for an independence that these female characters endure, Suma Kid shows the importance of confidence in one's identity and individuality. Despite the negative treatment and social judgment that they suffer, these rebellious women never give up on their dreams of freedom, ultimately emerging victorious in the end. The next speaker is Marissa Federico. The Black Power Movement emerged in the 20th century in response to the embedded influence of white supremacy in the United States. The movement's leaders advocated for Black autonomy in the U.S. through impassioned speeches, and the movement's core tenets impacted Black politics and culture for years to come. 
the Black Panther Party and energetic leaders like Fred Hampton affected change in Black communities throughout the U.S. despite backlash from agencies like the FBI. While the Black Panthers worked for political change, influential figures like musician James Brown and Olympic athletes John Carlos and Tommy Smith shaped cultural notions about Black identity and pride in the U.S. Beyond literature and athletics, the Black Power movement influenced pop culture and mainstream media and challenged white beauty standards. Although the movement developed during the 20th century, it remains pertinent for 21st century conversations about race and identity in the U.S. The Black Power movement uplifted the voices of the Black community as a whole, as did Maya Angelou, who also focused on specifically empowering African American women. Angelou's poetry, short stories, and autobiography encourage body positivity, confidence, strength, and Black joy as methods of rebellion and power reclamation in a world where African Americans face daily prejudice and racism. In her works, Maya Angelou primarily uses African American women as her speakers, sharing their resilience and highlighting their efforts to reclaim their voice in a society that seeks to marginalize and silence them. Angelou's writing, in particular her po poetry, highlights the Black female experience and also encourages African American women to see one another as role models, to share their stories, to lift the voices of their communities, and to think positively about their bodies and their identity as black well. women. The next speaker is Miranda Davis. The history of the Boston Harbor Islands reflects development in immigration, medicine, agriculture, and education between the 18th and 20th centuries. Immigrants to the United States, including Boston, were often viewed as infected and kept isolated. The Boston Floating Hospital reflected a new method of caring for urban immigrant populations in addition to influencing medical advancements. While patients of the Floating Hospital typically have positive experiences, Patients kept on the island often face poor living conditions and inadequate care. On Trotsky's Island, the Boston Farm School and Asylum reflected changing ideas about education, child labor, and agriculture. The school utilized a strict system to train orphan boards in agricultural work, but ultimately evolved following the changes of the Industrial Revolution. In the 20th century, programs like Outward Bound utilized the island and reflected additional changes in education and children's programming. Today, conversations about the use of the Boston Harbor Island continue as the island remains important to Boston and its surrounding communities. While the Boston Harbor Islands helped to enact societal changes, Roddy Doyle, an Irish novelist and playwright, shifted society's views by discussing negative attitudes towards women and immigrants during the 1900s in Dublin. Through the use of vulnerable characters, Doyle criticizes the avoidance of topics like mental, physical, and sexual abuse. He revealed the damaging influence of these forces on the mental health and well-being of his characters. In his novels, female protagonists face mental abuse as they occupy traditional roles of motherhood and caregiving, struggle against stereotypes about immigrants, and face physical abuse at the hands of their loved ones. The male protagonists in Doyle's novel struggle against the social expectation of to toxic masculinity as characterized by prejudice, violence, and a facade of deception. Ultimately, Doyle allows the readers to gain insight on the stereotypes that society has and leave them questioning the impact on of the marginalized people. Doyle's choice to not have the characters overcome these obstacles teaches the readers that these are not individual problems but rather structural and institutional issues that society must face. The next speaker is Jordan St. Louis. The Haitian Revolution resulted in Haitian independence from France in 1804, but the events of the revolution had impacts beyond the new island nation. The Haitian Revolution challenged well-established racial hierarchy of slavery and prompted the ideals of equality and liberty that defined previous revolutions in the United States and in France. Influential Americans like Thomas Jefferson and wealthy white plantation owners 
given the impact that the Haitian Revolution might have on enslaved people in the United States. They believe the Haitian Revolution could provide a model for a successful slave rebellion in the United States and worried about how this might impact the system of chattel slavery that formed the basis of the U.S. economy. These concerns shape the U.S. policy towards newly sovereign nation of Haiti, which the United States refused to recognize as an independent nation until 1862. The Haitian Revolution highlighted the hypocrisy of its powerful neighbor to the north, who prompted liberty and justice for all while upholding the system of slavery for centuries. The hypocrisy is presented in Emil Hart's novels, as well for gender-based prejudice or voiced by characters that are not typically seen in literature. But these characters choose to live for themselves instead of adhering to the expectation of others. And Lockhart further challenges these characters to grow by putting them in situations that are difficult. As the main, char as the main female characters try to overcome these stereotypes, the men have about them, such as viewing women as weaker, they do not let anything or anyone stop them from achieving their goals. Lockhart's female characters are able to push past these gendered stereotypes and walk with their heads up high. Even as they continually face criticism, they ultimately emerge stronger and with new opportunities for the future. These female characters act as lights to the world and models for strong young women everywhere. The next speaker is Sam Bittar. With humble origins of performances by the Negro, is a woman in the dry bed of the Congo River. To the well lit and furnished theaters in major cities like Osaka, Kabuki Theater has grown and developed along with people. Starting off with a single performer to a talented crew of women she gathered, Okuni developed her Kabuki ability into something that entertained all and drove them on. One of Kabuki, an all female performance, thrived as the women's acting and dancing and raised and roused all the community. These women thrive, preferring all kinds of roles. But Kuni's performance of skits and themes of love and affairs between noble samurai and prostitutes were enjoyed by many. This attention soon became too much in the eyes of the show unit, and the women acting in these dramas were banned for their promise to be fun. With no women allowed, Kuni, Wakashi Kabuki rose up. As a cast of all young boys who performed every role and was easily as popular as one of the media, if not more, the array of comedic personalities and acrobatics. Like its predecessor, a major problem during the time that was being cracked out. Now, no women in the government to perform. It is up for adult men to perform all roles in the movie. Yaro Kamuki settled to be the new movie, as it was still used to him. Onagata, adult men specifically trained well in performing the roles of women, thrived in popularity. Kabuki's success through the years and wide range, being an art form for both rich and commoners to enjoy, new and relevant stories were created along with the development of Japanese society. With its rich history and the hard work that's put into every single role, actors take pride in their lineage. The restrictions from the shogunate Kabuki theater had grown and developed into an expressive and accessible style of performance for all to bear. Restrictions from governing authority can be put straight on those under it. This is a prevalent theme in Anthony Burris' novels. The main protagonists are often limited in their actions, and those not in their normal habitat in life are often persecuted by society systems put in place to keep people in form that is deemed acceptable. Policing and reformation is a major part of Alex's journey in the novel of Clockwork Orange. After being imprisoned for a robbery turned murder, Alex was given a chance at reformation. This new type of reformation was a hope, was a hope of the government to empty overcrowded prisons. With the harsh treatment, poor treatment, Alex was molded into what they thought was a world changing for them. Despite being trained to be fit for society, police harassed and abused Alex. 
similar to Paul's experience in harsh post-war Russia in hunting for the bears. Police and government workers are extremely suspicious of Capitol's practices going on. And Paul's main goal is selling cheap dresses. He's on his toes the entire time, fighting with what Russian needs to him. In the beginning of his journey, Paul and his wife were heavily monitored by Russian authorities. With knowing that his life or imprisonment in communist Russia, Paul must create various explanations for what his business is. During their time there, Paul was beaten and humiliated, while his wife enjoys her time in the hospital, having to stay in Russia forever. Even till the end of smuggling, even till the end, smuggling out the son of the skin was a struggle with the questioning authority breaking breathing down his neck. A similar chase from the authority follows Dr. Spender in Doctor is sick. Despite the majority of the novel taking place in Spender's mind during the coma, the fear of the hospital staff and police finding him and bringing him back to the hospital in order to operate on his brain will haunt him as he tries to find his wife in post war London. The next speaker is Anna Glendale. The United States is called the land of the free, but is the home to the largest number of incarcerated people in the world, including a significant number of people awaiting execution on death row. The significant racial disparities in the incarcerated population of the U.S. date back to the Black Codes and the vagrancy laws that targeted Black Americans following the 13th Amendment and the end of the Civil War. Discriminatory practices continued throughout the 20th century, and during the war on drugs, the United States prison population skyrocketed because of new policies and legislation. Again, communities of color were disproportionately impacted by policies like stop and frisk searches and legislation that created mandatory minimum sentences. Racism also shaped decisions about the death penalty in the U.S. throughout the 20th century. Over the last 50 years, people of color have accounted for a disproportionate percentage of those executed under the death penalty and those still in the prosecution. Ghanaian author Yami Yassi writes about race and identity in her novels, Homegoing and Transcending Canada, depicting instances of systemic racism, discrimination, and prejudice against people of color. In Yassi's writings, the harmful effects of systemic racism are shown not to only cause long-lasting internal damage to the identity development of characters, but can also lead to moments of physical danger for characters who live in an unjust world. Yassi specifically discusses the negative impact that racist stereotypes can have on all members of the black community as they fight against prejudice in order to reclaim their true identities. In addition, Yossi highlights the difficulty of being a woman of color as her female characters experience daily racism and sexism. Yang Yossi portrays characters who have, who have to fight against obstacles of gender, social class, religious, and racial oppression. These characters are only able to overcome these obstacles by truly embracing and accepting their cultural identity. The next speaker is Zoe here. Culture, economy, politics, and international relationships. Tom's culture is not only an inheritance from people from Jester Street, but it also tolerant with other cultures from outside town, which is very history. Tom is a group of diverse culture resulting widely famous trade to Silk Road. Along with the Silk Road comes a high tolerance of culture that brings Tom more talented people and groups. A successful economy set a base job for the whole society's improvement. In the following decades, with the few world rulers that they should be called the Latin and the Sarkra, Tang moves into a more advanced and civilized society. They should be being not only a world ruler, but also a great general. Under his job, Tang has the most strong military strength among other surrounding countries, along with Tang's moral values. Classism, culture, economy, and social structure. Similarly, Bajos Huxley also portrays society that follow different social values. 
is too famous now world, brave new world, and Ireland discusses a dystopian society and a utopian society respectively. Brave new world focuses on depicting a whole world with a strict social class system and a controlling government that ends up limiting individualities inside the society. Island focuses on depicting an idealized world that respects nature and gives its citizens the freedom to self-educate instead of greenwashing them. Huxley displays a variety of things in these two texts, like the struggle between individual and community, the difficulty of adhering to social norms, and the danger of social hierarchies. Huxley does not identify either as a perfect society, but he does talk about potential positive sides of a dystopian society and the potential negative sides of a utopian society. In this way, Huxley warns people the potential damage to individuality within a large community and the danger of existing in a world of extremes. The uncertainty of society and its progress, exemplifying the possible outcomes as the safe and peaceful session of Ireland, or the intense lack of freedom and paranoia as per the world. The next speaker will be Basil Bazardia. While the D.W. Griffith 1915 film, Birth of the Nation, depicts the struggles of the 19th century American South during the Reconstruction era, it had striking consequences for the 20th century United States. The film reinforced long-held racist stereotypes about Black Americans and cast the Ku Klux Klan as heroic saviors, leading a new wave of racist and nativist violence in the U.S. Prior to Birth of the Nation, the KKK had been in a period of decline with the widely popular film and promotional materials sparked a drastic increase in the group's numbers. Although Klan membership peaked in the 1920s, the KKK continued to promote white supremacy and violence, especially during the 1960s. The group responded to the civil rights movement with hatred and acts of terror, but claimed that their acts of violence were rooted in Christianity and patriotism. Today, over 100 years after Birth of the Nation promoted a resurgence in Klan membership, Americans continue to grapple with the issues of systemic racism, immigration, and violence. In Birth of the Nation, the identity of African Americans was portrayed in a stereotypical way in order to validate and encourage the teaching of Anthony Jr. Author Celestial N. explores the devastating impact that dehumanization and losing one's true identity may cause. A explores the struggles of self-identity and how one's cultural background can be negatively impacted by attempts to fit into American society. The identity crises of her characters are derived from a sense of constant isolation based on the pressures they feel to abandon their culture heritage in order to assimilate into predominantly white suburbs. As shown in Everything I Never Told You and Little Fires Everywhere, the protagonists Lydia and Pearl Journey through the difficulties of identity when they force themselves to create personas in order to meet society standards. Aang also depicts that this can also lead to difficulty in interracial relationships and how easily one's identity and color can be lost. In the end, these characters feel the need to escape the repressive environments to find or reclaim their true selves. The next speaker is Natalie Moore. Lockdown tragedy was an environmental issue that affected not only the residents of Niagara Falls, New York, but the entire United States. After William T. Love abandoned his plan for the construction of the canal, it sat abandoned for decades until the Hooker Chemical Company began dumping chemicals at the site in the 1940s and 1950s. Ultimately, a residential neighborhood was built near the site of the industrial waste. By the 1970s, residents of this neighborhood, including children and pregnant women, faced significant health issues caused by their exposure to toxic waste. Environmental activists responded to the crisis at the 
love canal and advocated for a federal response. The advocacy of the Love Canal residents prompted President Jimmy Carter to declare a state of emergency and organize a federal plan to address the event. The Love Canal led to a greater awareness of the environmental threats posed by chemical waste in the 20th century and fueled a growing movement for environmental activism that continues today. The impact that secrets and lies can have was seen in real life in the Love Canal tragedy as the Hooker Chemical Company secrecy and the United States Army's denial of responsibility contributed to a chemical and environmental nightmare. British mystery and thriller author Ruth Waring uses the themes of secrets and lies in most of her works, such as her novels and Dark Dark Wood and The Woman Captain Head. Ruth Ware shows that deception can create dangerous external conflicts such as human relationships and weakening trust. And can also cause internal conflicts and crises such as paranoia and loss of self. Where it exacerbates the struggle of her characters by placing them in a dark and isolating setting, forcing them to rely on themselves. The only way for our characters to free themselves from these conflicts is by seeking and telling the truth. The next speaker is Coco Leo. My history symposium is Beta Western School and in influence in civil rights movement. My English symposium is Music and Joy, Rebellion through Passion, Optimism, and Perseverance in Lesbian Gay Sports. During the civil rights movement, many influential leaders emerged and played different roles in fights for equal rights. One of these leaders was Beta Western. A gay black man who assisted Martin Luther King Jr. was against like the Montgomery bus boycott in 1963 marched to Washington for jobs and freedom. Russell learned about the Kenyan philosophy of non-violence in India, and he shared his knowledge with leaders like MLK. Although Russell had a significant impact on some of the most important moments of the civil rights movement, he was often kept behind the scenes. This was due in large part to his sexuality, which made him an easy target during the mid 20th century. Even if he worked for racial equality behind the scenes, Russell also advocated for gay rights. His advocacy was shaped by the persecution he experienced as a gay man. Although his name is largely forgotten, people should remember Ray Russell for his contributions to the black and LGBTQ communities. Vincent Hughes was a famous poet and author born in the same era as Bayer Rustin. He was also an activist and one of the leaders behind the Harvard Drug House. According to his autobiography, The Big Sea, Hughes was influenced by his grandparents' ideas of racial equality, which is part of what fostered his drive to continue his education as he wanted to use this to make a change in the world around him. Hughes wrote a lot of other works, such as poems, novels, plays, and biographies, all of which highlight the passion, optimism, and perseverance of African Americans despite racism, injustice, and oppression. In particular, Hughes uses jazz and blues as important motifs to show music as a method of seeking solace and relief, as well as a method for African Americans to reclaim their power and voice. In Hughes' works, he claims that perseverance and positivity are also crucial prerequisites and methods of rebellion for these African American speakers and protagonists as they fight to survive in an oppressive society. Ultimately, Jesus' characters are able to achieve internal joy and self-confidence, thereby reclaiming their power from the oppressive and racist society around them. The next speaker will be Courtney Churchill. Chemical weapons were first used by the Allies and Central Powers during World War I, when they proved especially deadly. 
After the war ended in 1918, nations and terrorist groups continued to stockpile and deploy chemical toxins as weapons, and the use of chemical weapons poses an ongoing threat in the 21st century. Following the September 11th attacks, the U.S. embarked on a military conflict known as the War on Terror and faced the threat of chemical attacks at the hands of Al-Qaeda. The K-2 veterans who were stationed at Uzbek during the conflict were exposed to chemical toxins during their service, and that exposure resulted in illness and death of thousands. Although chemical weapons, like the ones that harmed K-2 veterans, posed a serious threat, the government has failed to adequately address the ongoing danger. Legislation and increased transparency will help curb the use of chemical weapons, which have caused millions of deaths since they have been in use. Joe Baker's works explore the negative impact of wartime on the individuals living through these trying time periods. Through her atmospheric and intimate storytelling in Longhorn and the Picture Book, Baker investigates the theme of social class, specifically depicting the female protagonist's internal struggles with self-identity due to the social class in which they live. Her works also highlight traumatizing periods of war and the multitude of unpredictable wars that her male protagonists experience as soldiers, including isolation and homesickness. Baker's central protagonist, Billy and Sarah both fight against the idea that one's fate is predetermined by one's social class or expectations of their gender, pushing to choose their own paths. Escapism through dreams and the focus on brief glimpses of hope help the protagonists temporarily cope with their unfortunate lower class status, though ultimately these methods provide only a brief reprieve. Baker's works juxtapose the reality of the main protagonists with their hopes and dreams, revealing that they are unable to attain their goals or find their identity due to the restrictions of both their gender and social class. The next speaker is Tessa Cora. Testament or the Hebrew Bible is an important text that contains the, sto the stories of both the Judaic and Christian religions. The text opens with the book of Genesis, which details God's creation of the earth and its inhabitants, including people. It concludes with the last prophecies of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi. These stories and all the moments in between all impacted the development of Judaism and Christianity. Historians and archaeologists have studied the historical basis for the biblical events like the Garden of Eden, Solomon's Temple, and Noah's Ark. These ancient writings, which describe a mystical garden, a global flood, and a temple lost in history, retain their religious significance even as their origins remain elusive to historians. While there is some evidence to suggest that these stories are rooted in historical events, their enduring legacy is as a powerful religious story. An author who discredits and purposely misuses the Bible with his characters, Chuck Palahniuk is a master of satirical and gruesome writing. The cause of the disturbing and twisted biblical references in his text is linked directly with the rapidly declining mental health of his characters. With each character in Palahniuk's novel experiencing a decline in their sanity and well-being, Leaders encounter anxiety, dissociative identity disorder, depression, PTSD, and more. Filtering his plots through the eyes of these concerning and often unreliable first person narrators, Helena creates a space where the readers feel disconnected from both the story and the characters. Readers are forced to question whether they are being given the true story or whether the narrator is lying about who they are in order to manipulate them. Helena does not create a space where mental health is a problem to be solved. Instead, in his nihilist approach to his work, each character simply embraces who they are, even if their mental illnesses cause them to do harm to the world around them. And there is no greater meaning or morals for the readers to watch onto. The next reader is Elena Connors. Vincent van Gogh is one of the most well-known artists in the world. Recognizable for pieces like Starry Night and Summer Moments. But his talent is 
how oddly now mental after death makes in my days. My most passion and charm for painting did not develop until early adulthood. As a child, he was isolated and quiet, and his relationship with his parents was complicated. Van Gogh exposed that, was exposed to the arts during an apprenticeship with his uncle, who he spent his adolescence and early adult years practicing skills as an artist. He was inspired by the people and places he visited as an adult, and initially they painted people in landscapes. Ultimately, Van Gogh's work was influenced by post impressionist artists of the late 19th century. Despite his challenges of mental illness and his death at a young age, Van Gogh's legacy is the most impressive masterpieces. Joanne Rowling, more well known as J.K. Rowling, also had to overcome a challenging and complicated past. Rowling is widely recognized as the best selling author of the Harry Potter series. However, she has also written a series of mystery novels, both under her name and under the pseudonym Robert Gilbert. In these novels, J.K. Rowling focuses on the common theme of mystery and deception. Though the characters seen in these novels are vastly different, they also share some similar characteristics. Notably, in the detective fiction series Cormor and Strike, her, no her characters are drawn to the unusual because of their past traumatic experiences. Rowling also notes the destructive and overwhelming impact that social pressures can have on many of her characters, who often hide their true identity and motives in order to fit in. The art of lies and deception play an important role in novels as characters learn and grow stronger, overcoming false information and uncovering the truth. Next speaker is Cassandra Mitchell. Maternal mortality has posed a threat to women during labor and in the weeks following birth for some years. Despite the medical advancements made over time, in the early American Republic, birth was often a frightening experience marked by uncertainty during and after the Midwives had the skills and knowledge to address some of the challenges of childbirth, and they were key members of their communities throughout the 18th century. Black midwives proved particularly important in both the Antebellum South and the rural South after the Civil War, as they helped enslaved women, black women, and white women give birth. Ultimately, as formal medicine improved, the expert knowledge of midwives was abandoned in favor of practices and schools used by formerly educated male physicians. Despite the supposedly advanced new tools and equipment, maternal mortality rates in the U.S. did not decrease. Today, the U.S. has the highest maternal mortality rate of, in, of industrialized nations, but education, training, and patient advocacy to help offset the crisis. Women, and in particular women of color, have faced challenges throughout history including dangers around childhood and difficulty discovering the identity amidst social pressures. Arthur Britt Bennett explores the lives and struggles of African-American women and the unique conflicts that they encounter. In Bennett's novel, The Mothers, she introduces many characters who struggle to find their true selves while trying to conform to societal expectations. Bennett and Hap describes the different lifestyles and paths taken by twins leading to a conflict between the two and a conflict of identity caused by insecurity and jealousy. Venice protagonists struggle to find themselves and appreciate their own beauty in communities that are focused on prioritizing white beauty standards and white supremacy. In addition, Venice female's characters are forced to confront the rigid gender roles in place for women, especially in their relationship with men. Eventually, each protagonist overcomes her struggle with identity and becomes a woman role model and powerful mother figure that she had hoped to be. By embracing their race and their differences, these women empower not only themselves, but the next generation. The next speaker is Marcella Alexander. The Tulsa Massacre of 1921 was a brutal act of racial violence that devastated the Indian district. A successful minority black neighborhood in Oklahoma. Black, Amer black Americans created this self sufficient community in Greenwood, which was also known as Black Wall Street. While residents of Greenwood who died, the southern United States still grappled with the deeply rooted impact of slavery. The politics and social norms of the Jim Crow South, as well as ongoing lynchings and active white supremacist violence, ultimately posed a threat. 
Tulsa's white residents were angered by the success of the community's black residents. And this anger fueled the racist violence that occurred in 1921. A light bulb attacks black people, black homes, and black businesses in Greenwood, killing hundreds and causing significant damage to the neighborhood. The massacre had devastating effects for the black community, but members of the white bulb faced no consequences. Although the Tulsa massacre remained relatively unknown today, it reflected the spike in racist violence that shaped the U.S. in the early 20th century. Similarly, Octavia Butler writes in her novel about people who are forced to face society to try to racist, sexist, and prejudiced ideology while fighting back against their oppressors. Butler writes about Dana, the young white woman who time travels to the Antigua era in her novel, Kindred. Dana faces racism and brutal attacks from the slave owners in the South, and she fights with the pain and justice and the oppression of slavery until she is able to escape her ancestral line and return home. In the parable of the sower, Butler writes about a young woman named Laura Warren, whose hometown is attacked by people who want to hurt those who live there. Warren is forced to escape with a small group of people gathered and create her own community. Fighting for her freedom in a post-apocalyptic society. Butler also writes about Teray and Tatterbaster who overthrows the ruler of his society, taking his position and acting with kindness instead of with malicious intent. Butler's protagonists overcome difficult situations and emerge sharper for confident in themselves. The next speaker is me, Rebecca. Throughout history, women have played an essential role in Irish conflicts with the British. The women of Kumunawan were the first female activists to fight alongside the Irish Republican Army for Irish independence. In the early 20th century, women's roles were confined to the domestic sphere, and although many women embraced traditional caregiving roles during the 1916 Easter Rising, some women challenged gender roles and took up arms. During the War of Independence, women subverted feminine stereotypes to hide contraband, deceive enemy men, and gather intelligence. As gender roles evolved throughout the 1960s and 70s, more women became politically active and participated in the Troubles. The Price Sisters and Marie Farrell played important roles during the Troubles, and the women of Armagh Prison worked bravely and left a lasting legacy through their participation in the hunger strikes. These actions paved the way for 21st century women in politics, such as current Sinn Féin President Mary Lou MacDonald. Women in Ireland defy gender roles to protect their country and fight with the IRA while pushing for diversity and equality. The role of women in Irish society evolved to allow more women to become politically active. This is vastly different from the 19th century, as the opportunities available to women in Victorian society remain rigid and confined. Charlotte Bronte is an early feminist writer, living and writing during the Victorian era from 1837 to 1901. Her works reveal the experiences of women, exposing the strict social expectations around gender, as well as the stringent rules regarding social class. Bronte's protagonists reject Victorian society standards and push to have control of their own lives. These female characters defy economic limitations by taking jobs outside of the home as they are determined to be independent. Bronte ultimately shows the failure of Victorian feminism as her characters, despite their feminist qualities, end up married with children, fulfilling societal expectations that women must be wives and mothers. The next speaker is Abel Weather. The women's suffrage movement and the 20th century feminist movement resulted in women's right to vote, as well as a variety of other political and social changes. The movement for women's suffrage began in 1848 at the Seneca Falls Convention. Leaders like Alice Paul continued the fight for women's right to vote into the 20th century. From the beginning, however, the movement was marked by a racial divide, as many white suffragists often excluded black women from their collective activism. Black women, black activists like Ida B. Wells advocated for black women's right to vote alongside white women's efforts as the civil rights movement began, became a larger challenge to overcome. 
Although women gained the right to vote in 1920 following the ratification of the 19th Amendment, they continued to face unequal treatment. This led to the second wave of feminism in the 20th century, which faced the challenge of unifying women from a variety of socioeconomic and racial backgrounds. Despite the turmoil, turmoil and division within the movements, women gained important rights over the course of the 20th century, and the work of feminists continues to impact the dynamics of policies today. Regarding feminist advancements in society, we use an approach to Elizabeth Gilbert's novel, A City of Girls, and Spirit Band, using feminist critical lens. Gilbert's female protagonists come of age during the mid 20th century, and her novels focus on presenting rebellious women and the revolutionary changes that the United States occurs during the feminist movement. Gilbert uses the Bellum Roman structure in order to highlight the confidence and wisdom that her female protagonists developed during their rebellious search for identity. The personal conflicts within her novels encompass the upset around women's changing use of language, the shift, the shifting expectations for women's roles in society, and women's fight against sexual repression during the post-war period. Gilbert centers the women's liberation movement in her, in her novels as her female characters' stories of growth reveal how women were able to shape their place in the world and find their voice and power while coping with hardship in society. The next speaker is Delia Brady. Archbishop Oscar Romero dedicated his life to fighting against the injustices that impacted the people of El Salvador during the nation's civil war, a bloody conflict towards the end of the 20th century. Romero was a vocal critic of the violent activities of the groups involved in the conflict, El Salvador's government and armed forces, right-wing groups, and guerrillas. He advocated for the poor through his homilies and denounced the government's oppression of El Salvador's most vulnerable Romero became a light and darkness of terror through his companionship, his work to fight injustice, and his religious teachings during the Civil War. His words and actions provided a sense of comfort for the people of El Salvador, especially those disproportionately impacted by violence, to guide them in their Catholic faith as well. Although Oscar Romero was assassinated while celebrating Mass on March 24, 1980, he remains a well-known figure and a symbol of justice for people attacked by violence. He was canonized to saint in 2018. Oscar Romero's voice for the voiceless connects to the way Lisa Jewel writes about female characters finding their own voice in a world of betrayal. Oscar Romero stands up for others, while a woman in Jewel's novels learned to stand up for themselves. In her mystery and thriller novels, Jewel presents the ongoing struggle of women trying to find their own path develop trusting relationships as they navigate through societal standards about gender and issues of deception and betrayal. Jewel portrays the numerous obstacles that are presented to women and girls throughout <coughs> the novels in a number of ways, such as by using men as just charming but deceptive characters, depicting the insecurities that women face when they compare themselves to one another. Jewel Jewel's protagonists struggle to get past their previous experiences, betrayal and jealousy, to build friendships, develop trusting romantic relationships, and feel confident in their own identities. Jewel, a master of deception herself, keeps her readers on their toes and forces them to investigate their own relationships and insecurities. The next speaker is Taylor Nichols. significantly evolved over the course of the 20th and the 21st centuries to reflect the fears of each one. The origins of horror and film began with directors like George Moses and Todd Browning, who created the earliest film works of the film. While their films did not evoke horror in modern audiences, they taught subsequent horror filmmakers about the genre. 
Throughout the 20th century, American horror films reflected the societal fears and cultural anxieties of the century. These films were often shaped by concerns about warfare, from the global conflicts of World War I and World War II, to the controversies of the Vietnam War. The horror films of the early 2000s, meanwhile, reflected the 21st century fears of the 17th millennium. Often, these films depicted sensationalized true stories that had been packaged in detail. Although societal fears evolved over time, the frightening experience of human horror movies has remained the same. As horror films explore cultural fears, Hubert Selby Jr.'s novels depict the horrors of being trapped in poverty. Hubert Selby Jr. was born in 1928 in Brooklyn, New York, and was a part of the modernist movement in literature. He uses his own knowledge of his childhood home in order to show the gritty reality of working class women. Selby Jr.'s novels can be looked at using a psychoanalytic political approach as they critique the escapism used by those who are unhappily trapped by poverty. Selby Jr.'s characters desperately try to cling to their dreams and past memories, showing a desire to either go into a better future or back to a better time. Instead of truly escaping, these characters become stuck in a cycle. Unable to seek real opportunities for improvement, they become obsessed with the uncontrollable passage of time, which represents their lost sense of autonomy. By showing how the people of lower class Brooklyn are drawn to their dreams and memories, and by depicting their loss of agency through the unrelenting march of time, Hubert Selby Jr. illustrates and criticizes the inescapable cycle of poverty. The next speaker is Angel Carter. Hi, which lasted from about 1650 to 1726, has inspired popular and romanticized myths of freedom-loving, swashbuckling adventurers on the open seas. In reality, people who became pirates during the 17th and 18th centuries were often pushed into piracy because of the lack of other job opportunities and a desire for love. Although there is a uniform depiction of pirates in more recent books and films, there were actually different types of pirates varying the golden age of piracy. Privateers acted as pirates with the support of official governments and corsairs and buccaneers were named for the waters within which they had been operated. While stories depict pirates as the enemies of merchants and monarchs, the relationship between those with economic and political power was actually more complex. Some pirates even ended up working for the government later on in life. Piracy can have a positive impact on the economies of colonial port cities like the legendary Port Royal in Jamaica. Infamous pirates by Colt Beard often contributed to the mythic stories about pirates, and those stories continue to shape the perceptions of pirates in centuries later. The social and class limitations that convinced men to go to sea were also important aspects of the works of Elizabeth Gaskell. Gaskell is a Victorian author who wrote multiple books, short stories, and magazine contributions in her life. Critiquing how societal rules and expectations limited autonomy for all people. She critiques society not only in her own life but throughout history as well. She uses mostly female protagonists in her works and features other characters from many different socioeconomic backgrounds in order to show the differences in expectations by society. She criticizes the strict enforcement of gender roles, the corruption of the church, racism and xenophobia, and the unfair privilege that comes with them. Gaspel used his death as an equalizer between the rich and the poor, showing that neither can escape nature. Gaspel ultimately asks her readers to push back against their Eurocentric view of the world and to challenge their own assumptions about the rules of the society of women. The next speaker is on the page. During World War II, the use of propaganda in Britain, the United States, and Germany proved influential in promoting each nation's war effort and shaping the minds and opinions of soldiers and civilians. Widespread propaganda was of particular importance 
because World War II was a total war, requiring the full participation of civilians and industries in addition to the military. Although each nation had distinct goals for its propaganda, they all utilized forms of propaganda like posters, films, pamphlets, newsreels, and radio broadcasts to reach people and convey a clear message. British propaganda called for wartime conservation of valuable materials and provided civilians with a clear path to participation in the Allied war effort. In Germany, civilians and soldiers alike were inundated with propaganda that cast Jewish people as the enemy, while American propaganda evoked feelings of fear and hatred towards Japanese people after the attack on the Belfast. Just like propaganda shaped the battles of civilians and soldiers during World War II, the characters of British author Matt Haig's novels battled with their family relationships, suicidal ideations, loss of identity, and a high level of isolation. In the novel The Dead Father's Club, a modernized retelling of Hamlet, adolescent protagonist Philip has to deal with being haunted by his father's ghost, bullying, and a turbulent family situation. How to Stop Time follows a man named Tom, who struggles with his immortality, as difficult memories, a lack of connection, and external pressures begin overwhelming him. Lastly, The Midnight Library shares the story of Nora and her experience dealing with clinical depression as she fights with her self-hatred and her suicidal thoughts. Through a psychoanalytical lens, readers can see the author's own background dealing with mental illness as well as the internal struggles of his characters. Ultimately, Hake's characters strive to make human connections in order to overcome their own isolation and find their purpose and sense of self. The next speaker is Ron Weisfelder. Mental health institutions and treatments in the United States have, have changed drastically over time, as have perceptions of people with mental illness. Initially, people who struggled with mental illness were viewed as demonic in society considered mental illness professionals. The treatments of the 18th and 19th centuries reflected this perception and the marginalization of people experiencing mental illness continued over the years. By the 20th century, treatments have evolved to include methods like shock therapy and keep people in mental institutions from being isolated from society. Treatment facilities were dirty and overcrowded, and the people in those facilities faced abuse and inadequate care. The work of advocates like Dorothy Dix helped to improve conditions in mental institutions and perceptions of the mental health. New treatments like top therapy medication provided alternatives to while attitudes towards the community and Although mental health institutions and treatment have provided an increase over the centuries, the need for the ongoing progress continues to be universal. Those in men early mental health institutions had to fight against the number of challenges just as the character of Sarah Cody Donald was fighting against challenges and rigid gender roles. <clears throat> Sarah Gerber is a Canadian author whose main genre is historical fiction. Gruen uses events from the past, such as World Wars and the Great Depression, to analyze and criticize the structure of the world during those times. Gruen critiques that the expectations placed both on men and women, discussing how society's values, masculinity and femininity, can impact how people view themselves and how they conduct their lives. Ruins male and female characters are consistently defined and eliminated solely by their gender, which these characters fight to change the world. Ultimately, Ruin criticizes the concept of toxic masculinity and the negative social pressures affecting women and their lives, which by portraying strong women's situation. The next speaker is Lyle. Solid 
In March of that year, Charles Edward Jr., Cambridge's 21 year old son, with his wife and him, was kidnapped from the family's home in New Jersey. After the baby was taken from his bedroom in the middle of the night, investigators struggled to find out any leads other than the lens and the lucky one. Americans were horrified by the kidnapping, which was described in the newspapers across the country. The baby was found dead within a mile of the Lindbergh home, and in 1934, a German immigrant named Bruno Palmer was charged to spread a lot of American society called for Palmer to face the death penalty. And he was executed in 1936. The case, while personally devastating for the Lombards, was one of the most infamous of the 1930s and ultimately resulted in the kidnapping being made by both parents. Just as people responded to the kidnapping of the Lombard victim of Palmer, the public responded with equal charges of Graham Stoker's crimes. Graham Stoker is an author who wrote four stories that focus on how mankind responded to the supernatural in mysterious circumstances. Stoker is best known for the novel Dragon, when he shows readers a happy and normal society that suffers when introduced to the darkness and evil of the vampire. Throughout this novel, the characters face real horror and have their faith in God and their beliefs in gender roles and social class continually be tested. Stoker criticizes society's focus on strict standards around gender and by depicting how little these things matter in comparison to actual events. The next speaker is my name. In the 1920s, mass advertising persuaded Americans to spend their money on items they could not afford to pay for up front, like cars, kitchen appliances, or home furniture. As new products developed, the advertising industry grew. Many Americans believed that cars were an important household item during the 1920s, and they came to see cars as important for their daily routines. Although many Americans wanted the lifestyle they saw reflected in car advertisements, such a purchase was not within budget. Installment plans provided a way to purchase cars without having to pay the entirely upfront but they ultimately caused challenges for many families in the United States. Although many Americans could not afford the lavish lifestyle shown in advertisements, they felt pressure to make purchases because of the advertisements that depicted that lifestyle as the While many Americans in the 1920s tried their hardest to attain the lifestyle advertised to them, the women in Chris Blue Julian's novels are trying hard to fight back against the social expectations of Women in Chris Bogdan's novels are faced with negative stereotypes, traumatic childhood experiences, and isolation. Cassandra, in The Flight Attendant, struggles against the idea that women should settle down and have a family as she enjoys a promiscuous lifestyle. Alexandra, in the novel The Guest Room, not only faces the traumatic experience of being captured and forced into sex work, but also has to do with judgment and lack of understanding in the society around her. In order to cope with these pressures and their difficult memories, the method of unhealthy escape only creates more problems, and Bojalin's characters continually struggle to overcome their addictions, move past the perception that others have of them, and change their own views of themselves. The next speaker is Megan. Jack the Ripper is an infamous and but unidentified 19th century serial killer who remains well known today. Jack the Ripper targeted young women, primarily prostitutes, in London's impoverished white travel slums. This area was overcrowded and viewed unfavorably by London's wealthier residents. Its urban streets were inhabited by people living in poverty. The geographic and population of this area influenced Jack the Ripper's crimes, which he committed ruthlessly and quickly in the district's dark and narrow streets. British newspapers centralized Jack the Ripper's crimes and contributed to an atmosphere of fear for Londoners, even though his, he was only active for a brief period of time in one neighborhood. Although Jack the Ripper's crimes were brutal and his actions had caused great concerns, 
Detectives were unable to determine the serial killer's identity. Despite the collaboration among many different agencies and new strategies to try to discover his identity, the killer remained elusive. The mystery of his true identity has contributed to the killer's infamy and persist centuries after he converted his tribes. While Jack the Ripper was responsible for numerous tragedies in the late 1800s in London, Picoult writes about tragedies impacting modern American families and the trauma of these external pressures can cause. Two of Jody Picoult's most famous novels, My Sister's Keeper, in 19 Minutes, investigate the impact and tragedies and trauma can have on individuals, identities, and developments on their family relationships. In My Sister's Keeper, the Fitzgerald family is dealing with illness of a dying child and the resemblance of her siblings who feel forgotten. 19 Minutes follows an aftermath of a school shooting incident as characters struggles to work through their, what they have experienced. Throughout these challenging events, Picoult investigates how her adolescence and adult protagonists are able to find their identity and their resilience and rebuild their fractioning relationships. Picoult teaches her readers that in order to survive challenging things, it is important to have someone to always have and be a supporter and protector in one's life. The next speaker is Jim Cowan. The eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Pompeii, an ancient Roman training city, in 19 CE froze the city and most of its residents under a layer of ash and volcanic rock. Centuries later, the fossilized remains were unearthed to tell the story of the city and its residents prior to the catastrophe. Evidence suggests that Pompeii was a rich trading city whose elite residents demonstrated their wealth through elaborate pieces of art and accessories like fine jewelry. Their clothing served to further distinguish them from the city's poor residents and enslaved people who often lived and worked in the homes of the wealthy. The remains of domesticated animals like dogs and horses found centuries after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius provided archaeologists with further insights into the city's economy and daily life. These archaeological discoveries were augmented by the primary accounts of writers like Pliny the Younger, and centuries later, people remained captivated by the fate of Pompeii. Tragic events, such as the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Pompeii in World War II, lead humanity towards an understanding of a common morality, whether it be immediate or in many years following the event. In the Chronicles of Narnia and the Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis uses themes of religion masked by children's fairy tales to challenge one's understanding of faith in God within a post-war and present-day climate. He uses the light-hearted approachability of young adult literature in combination with satire to confront the prejudices people have about religion. Throughout Christianity, the conflict between the inevitable suffering of mankind and keeping one's faith has frustrated followers of Christ. Lewis does not renounce evil, but instead writes from its perspective and includes prominent representations of nihilism, temptation, and wavering faith in his works. Thus, Lewis reinforces the necessary truth that both good and evil exist within humans, and it is up to each person to choose their own path. The next speaker is Jenna Murphy. Throughout history, the structure and purpose of zoological parks have changed drastically. In their both aren't new benefited, the animals kept in zoos. In the earliest zoos, people kept animals captive to demonstrate their status in society. These wealthy and powerful people viewed animals as exotic decorations. Often the animals kept in these private zoological collections suffered inhumane conditions as they were traded as research improved and people learned more about the animals they kept, kept it, zoos developed a better understanding of how to properly care for animals. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, these advanced understandings contributed to the development of programs that helped animals in zoos. 
specifically with species who faced extinction. Improvements continued into the 21st century. Most modern zoos care for their animals properly, help with conservation efforts for threatened species, and provide opportunities for people to safely view and appreciate the animals kept there. Zoos have developed and changed drastically, just as the characters in Gail Foreman's writing change in each novel. Gail Foreman is a young adult and an adult fiction author. In her novels, Leave Me in Just One Day, Foreman discusses the theme of self-discovery. Both protagonists are strong female characters who feel stuck, trapped by the expectations of those around them. These women are struggling to identify the, their purpose in life and feel as though they are losing themselves. Foreman brings her characters to, a diff to different destinations as symbols for the internal journeys they are making towards finding themselves. She, is all she also uses supporting characters to help motivate the protagonists on their journeys and keep them on the right path. Ultimately, Foreman proves that these women do not need anyone but themselves, and both emerge more confident in how to live their lives. Foreman's novel depicts the positive impact that new experiences and environments can have on each character's perspective and inner strength. The next speaker is Greta Vermont. Throughout time, clothing has created social change and expressed emotions. In the United States, fashion has played an integral role in culture and history with trends like denim to disco showing the changing times. In the 30 years from the 1950s to the end of the 1970s, fashion not only acted as a catalyst, but an indicator of how young American women thought and felt about the world in which they lived. The clothing of the 1950s expressed young Americans' desire for a return to normalcy after World War II, as women returned to modest feminine styles following their more traditionally mass uh, masculine war time experiences. 1960s fashion reflected the rejection of rigid norms of the pre previous decade, as the younger generation criticized their parents, wore mini skirts, disavowed materialism, and adapted to the hippie lifestyle. 1960s youth attempt to escape society through psychedelic drugs and exotic aesthetics, which were reflected in the clothing. The desire to escape extended to the 1970s as Americans bought vintage clothing and embraced disco women. For the young women of these eras, fashion was a way to express individuality and dissatisfaction with society. Just as clothing is important to American culture and history, Afghan culture and history are important facets of Khaled, of Khaled Hosseini's novels. As an Afghan American himself, Hosseini takes various character perspectives showing the many distinctive cultural identities of Afghan people. He focuses on familial relationships, particularly under the strain of Soviet and then Taliban control in Afghanistan. In Hosseini's work, experiences of adolescent trauma and their impact are the focal point. His characters endure defining trauma in their youth, often connected to shame over their identity. Hosseini writes about these characters' lifetimes, during which they must deal with the anguish and humiliation from this shame. He describes how lasting this trauma can be, even over decades, as it haunts the dreams of his characters and impacts their every decision, whether consciously or unconsciously. However, Hosseini's novels end with a cathartic healing process, as his characters are ultimately free from the burden of their past. The next, next speaker is Mary Napar. The Scottish culture of storytelling has ancient roots. It has evolved over the course of two millennia. The famous ancient tribes of the Scottish Highlands began the tradition of storytelling with the unique system of symbols they used to record history. With the arrival of the Romans in AD CE and the spread of Christianity, Scotland developed a written history. The people of the Gaelic-speaking tribe of Argyle contributed to the evolution of Scottish storytelling by introducing folk tales that have been passed down by their Irish ancestors. 
These stories reflected superstitious beliefs and provided explanations for common yet inexplicable parts of life. They also included creatures like kelpies, mermaids, fairies, and ghosts, and reflected Scotland's geography. Scottish folk tales helped shape the unified national identity, and generations of Scots passed down moral lessons through storytelling. Although fewer people can recall the specific details of Scottish folk tales today, the tales are still viewed as an important tool for teaching the next generation. As Scotland's history contributed to the culture of folklore, forming a lasting national identity, the struggles of growing up in post-colonial Nigeria contributed to the identity of young female characters of Chimamanda and Rosie Adichie's novels. The impacts colonization had on Nigeria left inequities in gender, race, and social class, contributing to a society that presented European standards as an ideal. As young women, Kambili and Ikimabu learned how to push against these traditional beliefs. In Americana, Adichie explores Ikimabu's identity development and the different layers of oppression that she experiences as a non-American Black immigrant in the United States. In Purple Hibiscus, the protagonist, Kambili, works through the trauma of living in an extremely religious and abusive household, only discovering her inner power when she's able to experience life outside the grips of the colonized church. This theme of finding one's voice is evident in Adichie's novels as female characters, Kambili and Ipamelu, navigate their way to finding their identity, constantly dealing with the long-lasting impacts and deeply rooted values of internalized colonization in their society. The next speaker is Kelly Stanley. In the 1970s, New York City faced a financial crisis marked by job loss, the flight to the suburbs, and the failure of the social programs that were implemented as part of President Lyndon B. Johnson's War on Poverty. The crisis led to negative perceptions of the city's residents, especially poor people and people of color. Even though the so-called urban decay was the result of politicians' failure to intervene, systemic racism, policies like redlining, and a police department marked by corruption exacerbated the challenges that the city's residents faced. Although buildings fell into disrepair and drug use and crime rates spiked, this turbulent time also inspired new forms of art and music, like hip-hop, rap, and disco. The conditions of 1970s New York City also prompted a new wave of community activism, as city dwellers worked towards gender equality and increased acceptance of the LGBTQ population. New York City's independence pushed back against the racism, poverty, and perception of the city as a place of decay and cemented its status as a cultural capital for decades to come. Those in power took advantage of their privilege during the 1970s in New York City, a concept that Donna Tart analyzes throughout her novels. All of Tart's characters experience tragedy, but in different ways based on their gender, sexuality, and social class. Both The Goldfinch and The Secret History are centered around a working class man coming of age and navigating his place in society. Both protagonists are precocious and ambitious, but they are soon humbled when they experience tragedy. The goldfinch follows Theodore Decker as he struggles with the deaths of his parents, his own sexuality, and finding his place in the world. The secret of history follows Richard Pappen as he strives to improve his financial status by going to an exclusive college in Vermont. There, he becomes friends with a group of wealthy students and one tragic event binds them all together. Tragedy reaches all the characters in the novel, regardless of their social class, gender, or sexuality. Tart's overwhelming message to the characters is to watch their backs and to prepare for the worst, as tragedy is inevitable. The next speaker is Grace and John. The Red Scare was a time of hysteria that spread throughout the United States during the 20th century. 
The first Red Scare, which occurred from 1917 to 1920, was a period marked by the fear of communism and the perceived danger of labor movements. During this time, many Americans viewed strikes, unions, and other forms of labor organization as a communist threat to the United States. Following World War II, the American fear of communism resurged. This marked the beginning of the Second Red Scare, which lasted for the 1950s. The Second Red Scare was amplified by Senator Joseph McCarthy, who provided a list of alleged communist infiltrators in the federal government. McCarthyism destroyed the lives of many federal employees, as well as people employed in the film and journalism industries, like the Hollywood Ten. As McCarthyism cultivated an environment of fear and suspicion, his actions threatened civil liberties and called into question the freedom of the press. Although the Second Red Scare was brief, its consequences extended beyond the 1950s to impact American policy from the second half of the 20th century. Just as the people of the United States feared the accusations of McCarthyism, the protagonists in Dennis Lahine's novels fear facing the reality in front of them. The idea of confronting past traumatic events and the emotions that accompany these events is not an option for many of Lahane's characters, who struggle to overcome their stress and anxiety and choose to escape by repressing these incidents deep into their unconscious. Despite their efforts to forget, these characters are constantly reminded of these negative memories through their dreams. Though these characters feel isolated due to the grief and repressed trauma they deal with, they continually strive for love and acceptance. In order for them to achieve this love and connection, they must process their feelings and memories, finally having to confront their demons for the first time. who have guided them and invite them up. Their English teacher, Mrs. Kate Chan. Thank <laughs> you. 